And of course, what separates Israel, the United States, and other democracies when it comes to incredibly difficult situations like this is our respect for international law uh, and, as appropriate, uh, the laws of war. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we know that uh, Israel will take uh, all of the uh, precautions that, uh, that it can, just as we would. And again, that's what separates us uh, from Hamas. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, ten days ago, President Biden put forward a proposal that would produce an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, get all the hostages home, and put us on a path to an enduring resolution to the conflict in Gaza. Uh, it's a proposal that is very close to what Hamas itself had uh, agreed to some time before. Since the President put the proposal forward, countries throughout the region and around the world, as well as international organizations, have all endorsed it. Uh, Israel has accepted it. And the only outlier in this moment, uh, the only outlier in this moment is Hamas. So my message to governments throughout the region, people throughout the region is, if you want a ceasefire, press Hamas to say yes. If you want to alleviate the terrible suffering of Palestinians in Gaza, press Hamas to say yes. If you want to get all the hostages home, press Hamas to say yes. If you want to put Israelis and Palestinians alike on the path to more durable peace and security, press Hamas to say yes. If you want to prevent this conflict from spreading, press Hamas to say yes. Now, if we get this ceasefire, it also uh, opens the path to more durable security, calm, peace in Gaza. And for that, it's critical that we continue to work on plans for the day after to make sure that when it comes to security in Gaza, when it comes to governance, when it comes to reconstruction, we have the plans in place uh, to uh, move forward. That's going to be a critical part of uh, my conversations here in the region as we go on to Israel uh, and then to Jordan uh, and then to Qatar. Uh, throughout this process, Egypt has played a critical and leading role in supporting the proposal to get to a ceasefire and the return of hostages, uh, in working on these day after plans, uh, in being a critical partner as well for getting humanitarian assistance into the Palestinian people who so desperately need it uh, in Gaza. And I want to thank President Sisi uh, again for uh, a very good exchange and for all the work we're doing almost on a daily basis. Um, in Jordan itself, and we'll come to this in, um, in a day, we're going to be focused intensely on the humanitarian assistance piece and civilian protection because deal or no deal, it remains absolutely essential that we get more aid to Palestinians who need it, uh, that that aid gets around uh, and distributed uh, to those who are so desperately in need of it, uh, and that we continue to work on protecting civilians and get them out of harm's way. Uh, look, I think this is a critical moment because we see the possibility, we see the prospect of an immediate ceasefire, of getting all the hostages home, of getting on the path to a durable resolution to the conflict in Gaza. Uh, I know that there are those who uh, are pessimistic about uh, prospects. Um, that's understandable. Hamas continues to show extraordinary cynicism uh, in its actions, uh, a disinterest not only in the well-being and security of Israelis, but also Palestinians. Um, and there are those in uh, the region who are also working against uh, efforts to bring about a ceasefire and a durable peace, uh, who don't even acknowledge and reject uh, the existence of Israelis or Palestinians, much less their ability to live side by side in peace. But I believe strongly, this is now my eighth trip to the region since October 7th, that the overwhelming majority of people, whether they're in Israel, uh, the West Bank, in Gaza, throughout the region, around the world, actually want and believe in a future where Israelis and Palestinians alike can live in peace, in security. And for the United States, uh, we will 
continue our efforts every single day. First, to get the ceasefire, to get hostages home, but second, to try to put everyone in the region on that much better path. Mr. Secretary, Andrea. you say that everyone but Hamas has agreed to this. Benjamin Netanyahu has certainly said otherwise publicly, and the hostage families are saying you should try everything if this fails. And it's quite possible it will fail with him now toughening his position, more likely, uh, with his right-wing partners. If this fails, they want you to work through Qatar and deal with Hamas to get the Americans home. And we are reporting at NBC News that that is being discussed as a, a backup plan, if no other way to get a ceasefire, doing it without Israel agreeing to a ceasefire. Can you tell us about that? And also, if the war continues, won't the Palestinian death toll be unacceptable as the National Security Advisor in Israel has said, to the end of the year, after such a horrific death toll in getting the hostages out militarily this weekend? First, let me be very clear. Israel has accepted the proposal. Uh, in fact, uh, they were critical in putting it forward. So the only party, no, that's, that, is what, uh, that is what the official position of the Israeli government, and the prime minister. Um, so the only party that is not accepted, the only party that's not said yes, is Hamas. That's who everyone's waiting on. That's who the Palestinians in Gaza are waiting on. It's who the Israelis are waiting on. It's who the hostages and the hostage families are waiting on. It's who the entire region and the entire world is waiting on. And so we'll see. Does Hamas want to end this conflict, end uh, this war that it started, or not? We'll find out. But it's clear that virtually the entire world has come together in support of the proposal. And the only open question is, will Hamas say yes? So that's one. Second, in terms of um, hostages, my number one priority uh, the Secretary of State is to ensure the well-being of Americans who are in harm's way anywhere in the world, including those who are being unjustly detained or who are being held hostage. The best way, the most effective way to get everyone home, including the American hostages, is through this proposal, is through the ceasefire deal that's on the table right now. That's what we're focused on. That's what we're determined to, have, to, to see achieved. And finally, Andrea, in terms of civilian uh, suffering, civilian casualties, uh, civilian uh, injuries, the humanitarian assistance. Again, the, the most immediate answer to that question, the best way to ensure that there's not another civilian casualty, uh, is for the ceasefire deal to, to go forward, for Hamas to accept it. It's as basic and as simple as that. That's what's on the table now. That's what we need to see an answer to. That's what would end the conflict in Gaza. That's what would prevent more civilian casualties. If that's your top priority, wouldn't indirect talks for the Americans at least bring those Americans home, or possibly? Again, my top priority always to bring Americans home. And because of that, the most effective way to do that, to achieve that, to actually get them home, is through the proposal that's on the table. So let's see if we get an answer from Hamas. Mr. Secretary, right. after your meeting with Egyptians today, do you have a better sense for when Hamas is actually going to respond to this proposal on the table? It's been on the table for, as you say, 10 days at this point. And if the raid over the weekend to release those Israeli hostages could have a negative impact on how they respond. And then you're also meeting with Benny Gantz tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I wonder what your message is to him after his resignation. And if you are concerned at all, increasingly concerned about Netanyahu not having an end game to this war, given that the, that's the reason that Gantz stepped out of the government. So, so uh, on Egypt, uh, first, as I said, we greatly appreciate the critical role that they played in serving as a mediator and uh, trying to get uh, Hamas not only to the table, but to engage and now to say yes. I can't go into the details of our conversations today except to say that our Egyptian counterparts were um, in communication with Hamas as early, uh, as recently as a few hours ago. And so I got a, a not the, again, not going to, not going to get into any details about that, but I think um, Egypt, the United States, other countries believe that, again, we should be able to get to yes. But ultimately, I can't put myself, none of us can put ourselves in the minds of, of Hamas 
board's leaders, so we don't know what the answer will be. I don't have anything further on that. I just know that there's um, a sense of urgency among all concerned, uh, starting uh, with, with us, with Egypt, with all of our Arab partners, uh, the Arab League, countries throughout the region, well beyond, a real urgency in getting an answer and getting an affirmative answer, because it's the single best way to do what so many people around the world want. It's to get an immediate ceasefire, get hostages home, put us on a path to enduring peace and security for the people in Gaza and throughout the region. So we're working on that. Um, I think on virtually every trip to the, the region, including to Israel, I've uh, met with leaders in Israel, whether part of the government or, or not part of the government. Uh, and Benny Gantz is someone for whom I have deep respect. Uh, the decisions that the Israelis make about their government, who's in, who's out, those are decisions for Israelis to make. Not, not for us, but I'll continue to meet with, uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Gantz and others who lead uh, major political parties in Israel and who are going to be critical to, um, to the path forward. But based on his decision to step aside, are you increasingly concerned that the prime minister doesn't have a plan to end the war, given what he said? So you, 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 look, you've heard, me t you've heard me talk to this, and I think if we get a positive response on the ceasefire, that only underscores the urgency of making sure that we do have plans in place for what happens the day after. Um, because in the absence of those plans, then one of three things. Either Israel would have to stay, which it says it doesn't want to do, and we believe it, it, it must not do, and would be left holding the bag in Gaza, and would probably have a major insurgency on its hands for, for years to come. Or, in the absence of a plan, it leaves Hamas returns. or we have a, a total vacuum, and you just have chaos, lawlessness, uh, criminality, jihadist groups, etc. So it's imperative that there that there be a plan, and that has to involve security. It has to involve governance. It has to involve reconstruction. We spent the last five or so months since the beginning of the year working intensely with countries throughout the region on developing these plans. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that's going to be a, a big part of this trip as well, um, carrying those conversations forward. Um, it would be very good if Israel put forward its own uh, ideas on this, and I'll be talking to the government about that. But one way or another, uh, we've got to have these plans, we've got to have them in place, we've got to be ready to go if we want to take advantage of a, of a ceasefire, and bringing this conflict uh, to an end in a way that actually produces long-term security for Israel. Because again, in the absence of a long-term plan, in the absence of knowing what you're going to do, post-conflict in Gaza, it's just a recipe for permanent insecurity for Israel.